put as much information as you are comfortable with on it because if you don't put enough, you won't get the gift that uh, the church would send to you on behalf of the church uh, uh, gift card and everything. So, uh, But we would like to make connection with you and let you know that we appreciate your being here. And uh, prayer requests, please put that on there. We'll put it on the uh, church website and everything for people to be praying for. And um, also on announcements, <clears throat> the gospel gear that was ordered has not come in. It was hopefully going to be here today. It might be here Monday or Tuesday. And it's changed colors. It is due to manufacturing things. It's not going to be the blue or the gray. It's going to be hot pink. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing. But there is a slight difference, and we're hoping to get it here uh, this week. Um, we'll let you know immediately and the schedule at time for pickup. Uh, see Kelly Edwards if you have any questions. Also, there is a Christmas Eve service here this Thursday night, 6 p.m., and it is a candlelight service. We'll gather to sing, read scriptures, and contemplate and think about and talk about and our Lord and Savior and His coming and all that that means for us. Life groups will be beginning next, no, two Sundays from now, two Sundays away. Uh, we'll be starting. There will be four life groups. Uh, we encourage you to get involved in a life group. They're listed on the back of the, of the uh, worship guide. Um, you can find one either Sunday morning, Monday night, Monday night, or Tuesday night. Uh, find one and get involved, get to know the people, a portion of the people in the church because different people are in different groups, but uh, it's a good way to infuse yourself into the family of God here at Gospel. Also, membership class will be being offered on January 8th from 6 to 9 p.m. and January 9th from 9 to noon. It is a new members class or a membership class. You must attend both classes to be considered for membership. It does not guarantee membership. It just means that you know what we believe and uh, have been uh, un a full understanding of everything. And then we'd like to meet with you. And then if everything goes well and you have an agreement, then we'll present you to the church for membership. Tithes and offerings, like I said, will not be taken up. The boxes are back there due to COVID. There will be no passing of the plate. Mission spotlight for today is the Walls family. Uh, they are missionaries in Taiwan, and they have just launched their second church plant. They have also uh, purchased a property for their first church plant and still in need of raising $116,000. Church spotlight for today is Versailles Christian Church with Pastor Nick Demick. Is that how you pronounce it? Nick Demick? And uh, let's pray for them, too, that uh, they'd be brought up and nurtured through God's word and the preaching of the gospel there. Eitzen Road property, please continue to be praying for the sale of that. Also pray Joyce Hill is in Wayne Hospital, and Kim Schaefer is having surgery on Tuesday. I believe... Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we do come before you this morning. We are so, so very grateful of all that you have so richly blessed our lives with. Not only have you sent Jesus, your Son, the second person of the Godhead, to earth, to a lowly position, to be exalted above all, to sacrifice himself to take the punishment for our sin. Father, we are so grateful in that you reached down before the earth was ever created and saw us, desired us, and chose us in Christ. And Father, you brought all things to pass. Everything is in your hand. Lord, we need fear nothing when we know that you are so in control. Father, thank you for 
all your graces, all your love. Father, those that are in the hospital, those that are facing surgery, Lord, those that are at home and sick. Father, the sale of the Eitzen Road property. Lord, all these things are in your hands and we entrust them to your care with all the confidence, Lord, that you give us. Lord, we are so grateful, so thankful. Lord, increase our faith, increase our understanding of your word, increase our loyalty and our, our diligence to serve you, to honor you, to glorify you in all things, Lord. Thank you, Father, for everything. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Okay, if you would stand and join me in the call to worship this morning, we're in Isaiah chapter 2 verses 1 through 5, and as we come to the fifth verse, it will be underlined, and that's the one I'll ask if you would to follow along with me as we read. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountain and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come let us walk in the light of the Lord. Expected Jesus born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth, thou art. Of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Joy to those whose long to see the day spring from on high up Come, thou promise, rod of Jesse, of thy birth.
Amen. Well, let's read scripture together in Psalm 22, verses 27 through 31. And it says, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over all nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him, shall bow all who go down to the dust even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Amen.
pray together this morning. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son who was born to us. Lord, thank you that your child has been given. God, thank you that he is the one who is the savior of our souls, the keeper of our life. God, thank you that he was the one that humbled himself. Uh, Lord, that didn't grasp at who he was, but Lord, he gave himself to us. Lord, for our good and for your glory. God, I pray this morning that we would be captivated by the peace that you bring. God, I pray that our hearts would treasure you and you alone. God, help us to see you. Help our eyes to be open, our ears to hear, Lord, your truths. And Lord, may we submit ourselves to you. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you would, turn to Luke with me, Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, we, we live in a culture that is without peace. You look all around us, it seems like everyone is somewhat unsettled. There is fear, there is anxiety, there is doubt, there is a, a lack of security, there is relational strife, there is constant heartache, real disappointment. A real lack of peace. You know, I love this season because as believers, we really have something to celebrate. That Jesus was born to die, and through his death, he gives us life. He gives us real peace. I'm not talking about peace that is here for a moment because of circumstance and and we are happy. I'm talking about peace that exists in the midst of heartache and pain, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of, of disruption. That there is this settledness that we have in Christ. Because even as Tony prayed, we, we know many things are going on and, and all of these things are in God's hands. And that brings us a level of peace. That Jesus was born to provide for us what we could never produce on our own. The Christmas story is truly a death to life story. Because Jesus in the manger came to die in order to give life to all who believe in him. 
It's also in the season that we try to overlook everything that is wrong, right? Everything seems to be like this Christmas movie where there's heartache and pain, and then at the end, everything is made right, and everything, everyone is joyful, everything is just perfect, everyone has the greatest attitude, family pictures go amazing, you know, it's just perfect. But really, it's never really like that way, because everything really is broken, and, and as much as we focus on, on the festivities or the warmth of family or even giving to others, we know there are real struggles. The truth is we wouldn't be celebrating Christ. The truth is we wouldn't be celebrating Christmas a- at all if it weren't for the fact that something is wrong, that something is wrong with us, that something is wrong with our culture, that something is wrong with our environment, and that Jesus was the one that was coming to address those things. In fact, in Romans 3, 10 through 23, the Apostle Paul tells us what is wrong with us. Isn't it always great when someone points out what's wrong? He points out the fact that we lack real peace and how sin has left us in a state of, of chaos, in a, in a state of uh, disruption, in a state of rebellion, and that we're all under judgment. I want you to read this with me. It says in, in there in verse 10, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No no one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And their paths are ruin and misery. And notice verse 17, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatsoever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That Paul gives us Somewhat of a terrible and and really kind of a grim, dark description of our condition apart from life and and death and the resurrection of of Jesus in the manger. But he doesn't even leave us there. And I love that. Two chapters later in Romans 5, verses 6 through 11, look what Paul writes. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ was born and Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ came and Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So we get this grim kind of dark picture of our own sin, but then we get this amazing view of what Christ has done, how Christ came and how Christ died for us, the ungodly. This passage is a reminder this morning that Jesus was born for our justification, that Jesus was born for our reconciliation to God, that Jesus was born for our peace. That we couldn't do it on our own. That that there was no ability in ourselves. We had not the ability to achieve it in our own power. And that's why God graciously gave Jesus as a gift to us. And this really is the core of our gospel. That Christ came into the world to do what desperately needed to be done. That we could not do it in our own way. That he was born, that he lived, and he died in our place. And that this is the only true way to experience peace. 
peace through Jesus. Think with me to the time where Jesus has been crucified. He is put in the tomb. And we see in Luke 24 where the disciples are gathered in the upper room. John tells us, the Gospel of John tells us that the door was locked. That they were all inside and they were terrified to go outside. The world had just crucified their friend, their king, their savior. The one that they had walked away everything, uh, walked away from everything to follow. They left their livelihoods to follow this, this man. They saw him perform incredible miracles. They saw him heal. They saw him uh, bring about life. And yet he was gone. And so they're locked in the upper room. And in uh, Luke 24, verse 36, as they were talking about Jesus, all of a sudden we find that Jesus is standing in their midst. And what is the thing that he says to them? Verse 36, it says, Jesus says, peace to you. That we know that peace has just walked into the room. He knows that they are terrified. He knows of great anxiety. He knows how unsettled they are. He knows of real disappointment. He knows of frustration. He knows all of those things about them. And he walks in and gives them himself. That I am peace. To you. But he doesn't just stop there because he wants the world to know of this peace. In fact, in verse, verses uh, 44, just picking up, it's not going to be on the screen. We'll pick up in, in verse 46 in a minute. But he said to them, these are my words I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. That it was written before time that I was coming and that I would live and that I would die. And that I would be resurrected. And so he goes on to say in verse 46, And said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. He says, You are witnesses of these things. That you, my brothers and sisters, have witnessed the peace that I bring to you. That we know that repentance and forgiveness of sins only comes through me. And it should be proclaimed in my name to all the nations. The peace that you and I desire is Jesus Christ. You notice the gracious provision of peace and, and really the gracious provision of the gospel in this passage in verse 46 and 47 is the forgiveness of sins that was purchased by Christ's sacrifice on the cross and it was then confirmed by his resurrection. Now here's the thing and how we tie this together. Forgiveness is really a constant theme in the Gospel uh, of Luke, uh, Zacharias in Luke 1, prophesied that God would give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. John the Baptist's ministry involved preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus said to a paralytic, friend, your sins are forgiven. And to a sinful woman, he said, your sins have been forgiven. He commanded believers to pray, forgive us our sins. And while on the cross, what did Jesus pray? Father, forgive them. Now what we come to understand and we know from the scriptures is that forgiveness of sins is available only to those who repent. Repentance is the foundational biblical spiritual act that moves the heart in the direction of salvation. It's turning from sin's presence and turning from sin's power and, and, and dominance in our own lives and consequences. And it's turning to righteousness. That repentance should look like in all of our lives a, a desire to leave sin behind and to pursue righteousness. Now, it's not simply a bad feeling about our circumstances. 
We feel bad when we get caught. We feel bad when it doesn't go the way that, that we want it to go. It, it, it's not about feeling bad about your condition or the consequence that resulted from your sins. It's actually, repentance is actually mourning. It's actually lamenting. It's actually grieving what you've done. There's a real difference in feeling bad and, and weeping and grieving and mourning in your way of life. Many times we, we want to seek forgiveness just to get out of the situation so that we feel better even about ourselves. But the Bible declares that, that, that forgiveness and that, that repentance is prompted by the Holy Spirit who came to convict the world of sin and, and to convict the world of righteousness and really judgment. That those things are granted by God. In verse 47, that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name. That forgiveness of sins is only, and peace with God only comes through Jesus Christ. Since there is no, since there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus' name represents all that he is. Christ, Mary Christmas. And there's so much about this season that isn't about Christ. There's so much about even us at times that isn't really magnifying the name of Christ. That God gives us opportunity in this season for a whole month when the whole world is kind of looking at the holiday or even Christmas. For us to magnify his name. I love the fact that I went to a, to a middle and high school choir concert at, at my kid's school and they sang multiple songs about Christ. Now, I don't know if those kids even believe in Christ, but they're singing about him. And if they would even think about the words that they sing, that it's penetrating. I'm thankful that we live in community even here where people are saying Merry Christmas. They're, they're not worried about saying Happy Holidays. And I, I don't know when they say Merry Christmas if they're really thinking about Christ. But you know what? It makes me think about Christ. It makes me focus on Christ. It makes me even whisper a prayer. I hope they really believe in Christ. I hope it's a merry time for them in this, this time of year because they are focused on Christ. It's the name of Jesus that we focus on. It was Jesus' presence to the disciples that brought about peace. It's only Jesus that brings about repentance and forgiveness of sins through his life. Christ provided a righteousness for us that is not ours. And Christ bore our punishment and he offers it to every single person. It's given to us. It's received by faith alone. And when that faith happens, we are united with him and his righteousness is ours and we have peace with God. And so Jesus was born to come and live and to die so that we could have true peace. God's offer of peace and forgiveness goes out to all, but only the people who receive Christ and trust Him as Savior and Messiah and Lord will experience the peace that He truly brings. So, so are you experiencing peace? Not circumstance. Not everything being just right, because it won't be. Family comes in and messes it all up. It's never just perfect. But our perfection is not looking at our family. Perfection is looking at Christ, that he is the standard for this season and for these this moments that he gives us. He is our peace. Flip back to Luke 2. Luke 2, verse 14 give you a second just to turn there it's also going to be obviously on the screen but the truth is is that God's offer of peace and forgiveness it goes out to all but it's only those who receive Christ it's only those who believe and put their faith in Christ 
listen, it's not family traditions. It's not that you're Baptist or Lutheran or Methodist or Presbyterian. It's not your deeds. It's not your works. It's not the good things about you. It's by faith. Your faith put in Christ. In Luke 2.14, we read their glory to God in the highest. The greatest thing that you can do with your life is to give glory to God. In the way that you work, in the way that you live, in the way that you parent, in the way that you uh, are a student, in the way that you are a boss, the way that you're an employee, the greatest thing that we can do with our lives is to breathe for the glory of God. To have a heart and a mind that is focused and passionate about giving God glory. Giving Him our highest praise. But it says, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom He is pleased. That God's offer of peace goes out to all. But only the people who receive Christ and trust Him as Savior, Messiah, and Lord will experience this peace that is given. You get a glimpse of that kind of meeting in Luke chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. Jesus says to his disciples, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. That's the offer of peace to all. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. The truth is, is that God's peace in Christ is offered to the world. But only the sons of peace receive it. And how do you know if you are a a son or daughter of peace? How do you know if you're a part of of the angel's promise, peace among those with whom he is pleased? How do we know? Because we are a people who welcome the peacemaker. That we are a people that seek and receive the peace that only he he can give. We are the ones that desires the peace that he brings to us. We are the one who's been loved and he loves and we love him. My hope for us in this season is that we really would enjoy peace. Not just saying it, not just saying that we're okay, that everything is just right. We know that there are global aspects to this peace that that lie in the future when uh, a verse I read Sunday night, Habakkuk 2.14, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We know there's a future day that that will take place. We know there's a future day like Isaiah uh, 9 verse 7 where of the increase of his government and the peace there will be no end. We know that there will always be peace. There's a coming day where we will experience peace forever. We know those things, but Jesus has come to initiate that peace. And and we see that peace in the relationships in our own lives. We see that peace, and we can pursue it, and we can enjoy it. We can enjoy peace with God. We can have peace within our own souls. We can have peace with, with others. And so I just want to look at that for just a moment. Luke 2, 14, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace. Are you experiencing peace? What's the main point? The the main point this morning is just simply this. God's purpose is to give you peace by being the most honored and the most celebrated person in your life. You celebrate God above everything else. You honor God above everything else. You will have peace. You will know peace. You get up and you seek him in his word. You will know peace. There's five different times in the New Testament that he is called the God of peace. In Romans 15, in Romans 16, in Philippians 4, and in 1 Thessalonians 5, and in Hebrews 13, we see that he's called the God of peace. In John 14, 17, Jesus said, my peace I give to you. And Paul said in Ephesians 2, 14, Jesus himself is our peace. What this really means for us is that the peace of God or the peace of Christ can never be separated from God himself or Christ himself. Meaning you're not going to find peace outside of God. You're not going to find peace outside of Christ. 
They go hand in hand. No God, no peace. No Christ, no peace. You experience it. It's, it's experiential. You're walking in out. That there's a settledness, that there's a, a trust, there's a faithful presence of God in your life, and, and you're good. As the psalmist said, the mountains might be sliding into the ocean, but you are still good. Why? Because we can be still and know that He is God. His purpose is to give you peace. But the only way He can do that is by being the most honored and celebrated person in your life. Celebrate above your family. Celebrate above your career. Celebrate above your ambition. Celebrate above your wants and desires. And so the key is to keep it together. Glory to God. Peace to men. Glory to God in your life. Peace with God. Peace with others. A heart that is fixed and a heart that is focused on showing the glory of God will know His peace. God getting glory and us getting peace. How does that happen for us? It's by believing and trusting the promises of God obtained by Jesus. In Romans 15, 13, it's one of the the kind of a fundamental text pointing to the role of faith. It says this in Romans 15, 13. It's on the screen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. That God desires to fill you with his joy. That God desires to fill you with his peace. But it doesn't come apart from him. It comes in believing. In believing, in other words, the way God's promises become real for us and and produce peace in us and through us is in believing and trusting in him. It's when we believe them. We believe the scriptures. That's true whether we're talking about peace with God or or peace just within ourselves or, or peace with other people. And so I just want to simply ask three questions. Number one, do I have peace with God? Do I have peace with God? The most most basic need that you and I have is peace with God. This is really foundational. If we're trying to pursue peace, I mean, this is where it it begins. If we don't go here first, all, all other experiences of peace will be superficial. They'll be temporal. They won't last because God's the foundation. In fact, we can, we can sidestep God and modify behavior and it lasts for a little while. We start with God and his glory and he makes all things new. And when he makes all things new, it begins to go horizontal in our relationships with each other. But one of the key passages of Romans 5, I almost went there last week talking about just how we are justified. And so I want to come back to it this week. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. We've been justified by faith. That, that's the pivotal act of, of believing. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified means that God declares you to be just in his sight by imputing to you the righteousness of Jesus. We talked a little bit about that last week. And that is done by faith alone. Since we have been justified by faith, it's it's not by works, it's not by tradition, it's not by baptism, it's not by church membership, it's not by, by holiness. I'm not saying that those things are bad. I'm saying those things don't bring you salvation. But people are trusting in them. People are believing in those things. They are believing in tradition. They're believing by their family being in church. My family's there. I'm good. See, if we don't start with the glory of God, we're not good. If we don't start with submitting ourselves underneath God and his glory, we're not good. It's not like my glory and God's glory are on the same plane. I I pray that God breaks our hearts for our family and friends who think that they're okay. I pray that we as a body of believers would pray more and and do more 
to be a witness in those people's lives. Because friends, it's by faith alone. When we believe in Jesus as the Savior and and the Lord, and he's our supreme focus, the supreme focus of our lives, we are united to him. And his righteousness is, is counted by God as ours, that we are justified by faith. And as a result of that, what do we receive? We receive peace with God. That God's anger at us because of our sin is put away. That that our rebellion against him is overcome. That God adopts us into his family. And from now on, as you think about it, in all his dealings with us, they are for our good. He will never be against us. That that he is our father and our friend. That we have peace. That honestly, we don't have to be huddled up in an upper room terrified. Because God is in control and God is our peace. This is important. Would you say that you have peace with God? Would you say that you've been justified by the death of Jesus? That it's by his sacrifice, that's what you're trusting in for your security and salvation? Or is it yourself? Secondly, do I have peace within my own soul? Do I have peace within my own soul? This is more of like looking holistically into our own lives because that that does matter. I mean, some of us can be in here from, from week to week and we can be unsettled within our own souls. We know that sin is real. We know temptation is real. We know the the battle, the war that we face is is real. And and Jesus came to overcome. Jesus came to give us his resurrection power and that we can live in that. But you know, we sit here many times and we sit defeated. We look to ourselves instead of Christ. And you might be sitting here, honestly, and and you are defeated within your own soul. It's It's a real struggle. And so the truth that I just want us to see is because we have peace with God because of being justified by faith, we we can really begin to grow in our enjoyment and in our joy and in our peace within our own souls. The Bible speaks a lot about guilt. It speaks a lot about anxiety. It speaks a lot about fear. It speaks about the things that tend to paralyze us, to make us kind of hopeless. And here again is us being people of the Word, that we see the Word, that we are reading the Word, that we are reciting the Word, that we are hiding the Word in our hearts, and we we fall back on the Word. It's our our first go-to. To say, I'm struggling, but God is in the midst of the struggle. How can I glorify God in this? Paul writes about this in Philippians 4, in verses 6 and 7. It's one of a, I think it's, 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 it's just a passage that means a lot to me. He says, do not be anxious about anything. What's the opposite of anxiety? One could say that it's peace. If you don't have anxiety, you have peace. It says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, he says, let your request be made known to God. But he doesn't just stop there. In verse 7, he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What does the peace of God do? The peace of God that doesn't make sense many times in our own life. The peace of God that overwhelms us in the moments of difficulty. The peace of God that is hard to fathom. It is guarding our what? Our hearts and our minds. And it's doing it through who? Through Christ Jesus, who is the only one that can give us true peace. I mean, think about that for just a moment. Think about what he brings. The the picture here is that our hearts and our minds are kind of under assault. It it could be guilt. It could be worries. It could be threats. I mean, really, what, what are your greatest fears? What are your greatest fears that you don't even talk about? 
What are your greatest anxieties that, that you experience, that, that you know of in your own life? Paul says that God wants to guard our hearts and our minds from those very things. Isn't it amazing when we live to give glory to God, that God is for us, that he guards us, that he guards it in a way that goes beyond our understanding within our own finite minds? Isn't it amazing that he gives us unexplainable peace? It's not even rational at times, but his word is rational. It's trust that I know that I'm secure in him in the midst of the struggle. Notice that within this text, he does it when, and he does it when we take our anxieties to him. He does it when we take our fears to him, when we go to him in in prayer and trust him that he will carry them for us. 1 Peter 5, 7, that he will protect us. Cast all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. He loves you. So, so when we do this, when, when we come to him and remember that, you know, we're our, we already have peace with him. And so, so when we come to him because we, we trust him as our loving and, and almighty heavenly father to help us, that his peace comes to us, that his peace steadies us, his peace balances us out, his peace pokes holes in the lies of the devil, his peace reminds us that we can trust him over and over again. When you trust in God, who gets the glory? God does. When we seek him in the midst of our anxiety, who gets the glory? God does. When we go to him with our fears, who gets the glory? God does. We, this Christmas, can take our anxieties to God. We don't have to sit here and act as if they don't exist. We can tell him about them. We can ask him to help us. We can ask him to protect us. We can ask him to restore our peace to us. Maybe there's relational conflict in the midst. Maybe it's it's gathering with a family that that you're not looking forward to. Whatever it is, you can take those exact things to the presence of God and say, God, I just can't handle this on my own. I'm overcome. My, may I find my rest in you. Do you have peace within yourself? Do you have peace within your own soul? It almost is as if I'm psyching you, right? Like I'm trying to get in your head. But no, it's real within us. If, if I am not living for the glory of God, then I know there's unsettledness within me. The third question. Do I have peace with others? Do I have peace with others? God God wants you to enjoy peace with others. In fact, there's a lot in Scripture that talks about how we deal with one another. Spend a long time on that. And so there is a way that God wants us to interact with each other. And that we can enjoy peace in our relationships with each other. But you know what? This is the one that we have the least control over. You can control you. You can't control everyone else. You you can control the way that you respond. You can control the way that you react. You cannot control the way that everyone else responds. You cannot control the way that everyone else reacts. And so you have the least control. And for, for you, that might be the control freak. This really bothers you. Because you want to control everything and everyone. But how do we handle that? We need to say carefully, just as kind of Paul says carefully, in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, he says, If possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. I mean, Christ came, was born, lived, and died so that we would know peace, know peace with God. No no peace really within our own souls that that we are resting and trusting in God and that we relationally can have peace the best of our ability with the people that are around us. 
For many of you, when you gather together with family for Christmas, there will be some awkward, maybe, maybe even painful relationships. Sometimes we look over that. Sometimes we, we look over the relational strains and, and we want to keep everyone happy, but sometimes we bring that to the party. Some of the pain that people experience is very old. We, again, tend to overlook that. For some people, pain is very new. For some, gathering with family or friends or, you know, uh, parties at work, things that, that are going on, sometimes it rips the band-aid off of wounds and they become very real. And so in some relationships, you know what you have to do, no matter how hard it is. But, but other times, in our own life, in, in relationships with others, we're confused, we're kind of baffled, we don't know exactly how to handle it, we don't know what the path of peace really calls for, or maybe sometimes what it actually really looks like. And so in all of that, the key is trusting the promises of God with really a heartfelt awareness to who we are as sinners. What do I mean by that? Well, our awareness is that Christ forgave us. And if Christ forgave us, then we too should seek ways to forgive others. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 kind of bring us to that. Paul says to the church of Ephesus, which we're getting ready to study in our life groups, January 3rd, get in a group. Four different groups opened up another group, and we praise God for that. And uh, hopefully we uh, will see you in it studying the book of Ephesians. So, So just for a second, what does that actually look like? It's really people coming together. Um, I know the groups I've been involved in, we drink good coffee. It may, sometimes it's bad coffee, but you don't tell people it's bad. Um, you just drink their water if you don't like their coffee. Some people bring food, so you're snacking. A lot of times everyone's huddled in the kitchen. That's where, kind of where it begins. That's where the party starts is in the kitchen. You're just talking about life, the ebb and flow of life, the ups and downs. You're praying for one another. And then you're opening up a book like Ephesians. And you're reading it together. And you're studying it throughout the week. And you're thinking through the text. And you're letting God work on your hearts with his words. And then you're coming together to discuss those words. And you're encouraging one another. You're lifting each other up with those words. And uh, it really is something that is really good. And so if you're in Ephesians coming, come January, you'll get to this text eventually. But Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, Paul says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. He says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So there's a couple of things that I just want us to be reminded of. Because we have been given peace through Jesus Christ. It's by faith alone that we have been justified in Jesus. That we now live to glorify God, to honor and celebrate God as the most important person in our life. And when we do that, we slowly begin to discover peace within our own lives. But then we slowly also extend peace to others. I mean, we'd like to think that we are transformed and saved in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and all of a sudden we're perfect and every relationship is just right. But that's not true. It's really interesting. I've been looking at Paul and his epistles and some of his writings and just focusing on the conflict that he faced. Following Christ will not be absent from conflict. We would love to think that it is. But actually, over and over again, it's what grieved Paul. It's over and over again what what at times discouraged him even. And so I don't want to paint a picture that everything is just going to be perfect and right, but but to help us in this cultivation of, of peace, just a couple things. Continually cultivate a sense of wonder and worship. 
as we think about glorifying God, as we think about peace within, as we think about peace with others, the only way that that really happens is, is if we continually cultivate really wonder in who God is. It's this imagination. It's this, it's this thought of who God is and constantly thinking about who God is and it's worship. If, if I stop wondering, if I stop worshiping, listen, peace goes out the door. So you and I must get good at cultivating habits of wonder and worship and, and really sitting before the Lord. That in spite of all of our sins, God still sent his son. That in spite of all our sins, God has forgiven us through his son. I, I would just see, say, be amazed that God actually loves you. I am. I'm amazed that God actually loves me. So don't stop wondering. Don't, don't stop worshiping. Be amazed that God loves you. Have that sense of wonder that, that you, a, a sinner, that me, a, a, a sinner, have peace with God. And honestly, that, that peace with God, as Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, as we think about that more, that honestly makes our hearts tender. How do we become tender-hearted? I mean, some of us, our hearts are cold. Maybe we're distant. Maybe we're bitter. Maybe we're resentful, and that consumes our hearts. Listen, I would just say get back to glorifying God. Get back to the wonder and worship. Get, get back, and what happens as we look at him more and more, as he consumes more of us, he's the one that takes our heart uh, of stone and turns it and makes it a heart of flesh. He's the one that softens us. And honestly, maybe Christmas this time, this season, in some ways makes you bitter, makes you resentful, makes you fill in the blank. And when I say makes you, I'm saying you allow it to consume you. You and I are called to think on things that are pure, to think on things that are good, to, to think on things that are right and righteous. And, and when we don't, when we do, when we're, we're doing those things of thinking on things that are pure, right, and righteous, we do, we do have a real sense of peace. When we're thinking on all the wrong things, there is no peace. And so, continually cultivate a sense of wonder and worship. Another takeaway would be this. Continually be overwhelmed that your wrongs have been forgiven. I know I kind of said that before, but I just want to make it the focus. Just, just continually be overwhelmed that, that your wrongs uh, are forgiven. It's, it's going to be at times maybe thrown back in, in your face. It certainly was thrown back in the face of, of Jesus on the cross. That, that hurts, and, and it can make you bitter if you're not careful, but don't let it. Continually be overwhelmed that your wrongs are forgiven, that you are right within Christ. Thirdly, continually be amazed that you have peace with God. I think it's just this sense of awe that many times we look past, we forget. Why be amazed that you have peace with God? Because your guilt has been taken away. You have been forgiven. Lastly, this morning, peace with God as we really think about it, we need to continually trust God. Continually trust him, his word, his promises. He, he knows what he is doing. Keep his glory, not, not your success in focus. Keep, keep his glory, not, not your ambition in focus. Keep his glory, not, not even your kids. You know how you can idolize your kids and, and, and you know what? You were never the, the sports star. I mean, I look, I look at Titus and he is really athletic. I think beyond what I really ever was. And if I'm not careful, I could be tempted to make an idol out of that i would say keep god's glory above everything else and that's a good question that we can ask others how are you glorifying god in your life 
How are you putting all the attention on him? How, how are you directing everyone's focus to not you, but to the God, our Savior, our King? Keep his glory in focus. If you keep his glory in focus, you know what? We become more effective at peacemaking in our relationships when Christ is central. And so is Christ really central? You know, glory to God in the highest. And what comes after the glory of God? Peace. May God help us to focus on his glory so that we might truly know peace. May you know peace in this season. May you know peace within your own soul. And may we excel and grow at extending peace to each other. I don't know where you are in your relationship today. I, I don't know everything that's going on within your hearts and minds. I mean, you could be a person that's sitting here that, that, that you come uh, around this time of year every year because it's just the thing that your family has always done. You could be sitting here this morning and, and, and you don't know God. Maybe you've tried through your own works. Maybe you've tried through your own ways. But as we talk about being justified only in Christ, about us repenting and lamenting our own sin and receiving Christ, maybe you say, you know what, that's not me. And so maybe today you realize how God is speaking into your own heart and life. And maybe today it's just simply repenting and believing and trusting in Christ for your salvation and your salvation alone. And maybe you're sitting here and you're resentful. Maybe you're sitting here as a believer and you're just distanced. Maybe you're sitting here and, and you're upset, you're frustrated, you're mad. And I would just ask you, are you focusing on the glory of God? Or are you focusing on something else? Because it's easy to be sideways in my life. It really is when I am not looking to the glory of God. And if I'm not looking to the glory of God, I'm looking to the glory of Bill. And that never works out well, ever. And so may we be a people that trust him. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're thankful that even while we were yet sinners, that you sent your son Jesus for us. That he died for us. And God, this morning I pray that we would be a people that are fully trusting in you alone. That we know that we are yours. That we are sons and daughters of the King. And God, I pray this morning that we would be a people that are seeking to give you glory above everything else. But God, you know how our hearts can be fickle. You know how we make decisions based on feelings and emotions. Lord, you know how we manipulate to get what we want and God I pray that we would be a people that are quick to repent of that and God that we would see how we consume all the attention instead of giving all the attention to you so God I pray that you would help us this morning to be a people that focus on you that we would see you as you really are God thank you that you sent your son to us thank you that he is our savior and God, there may be someone here this morning that doesn't know you. There may be someone here this morning that, that is distant from you. God, I pray maybe today they, they know they need to repent and believe and trust in you and you alone. And so God, give them the courage to do that. And Lord, there's also people here today that might be just distanced, maybe in rebellion, maybe far from you, maybe just resentful, maybe just bitter, maybe just consumed with something other than you. And God, I pray they would feel the conviction of that as well, God. And I pray that you would help them this morning to cast their eyes upon you and the promises that you've given us, Lord, to trust you. Help us to be a people that bring our cares and our anxieties to you. You want them. You care for us. You are not distanced from us. And so, God, I pray that you would help us just to move to you today, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We have some people that are standing out the back, a, a husband and wife. And if you're here this morning and you just have some spiritual questions and uh, you are battling, wrestling with some things, there are some people here that would be willing to pray with you, to help you, to open up God's, God's word with you. And so I, I want to encourage you, if that's you, when we begin to sing, you can just go out the back door and uh, they would love just to take you and, and share with you. And so let's stand together and, and let's sing.
our benediction today, we're going to turn to Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. And it says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence or any of these things, or anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. You are dismissed. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes. And through it all, 